Hello everyone. We'll be starting the webinar in just a minute or so. I just wanted to um, say hello to everyone and welcome them and uh, we'll be back with you in just a minute. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending upon where you're calling in from. I'm Moira Watson, Director of Customer and Product Marketing at Glambia Nutritionals. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on the 2020 megatrends for the food and beverage industry. Today's webinar is being presented by Glambia Nutritionals. Our broad portfolio of nutritional and functional ingredients, our R&D innovation and application expertise, and our global footprint of state-of-the-art processing facilities can help you address any product or nutritional challenge. Whether you want to improve a product flavor, nutrition, stability, texture, or just make the next big thing, we're a partner you can count on to work closely with you. When we start the presentation, you'll see a split screen like this. You can drag the bar shown here to adjust the size of the video or slide portion of your screen. Before I introduce our topic and our speakers, I'd just like to cover a couple housekeeping issues. We encourage you to share your comments and ask questions. Please look for the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you have a question, just type it in there and I'll hold it for discussion at the end of our event. We're going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. We can also follow up by email to answer any additional questions if we run out of time. Today's webinar is being recorded. We'll be able to share a link to the recording with you via email this afternoon. We'll also post a link of the recorded webinar on our website in the news and insights section. We invite you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your friends. We also have a comprehensive guide to the 2020 megatrends, which will be available for download on our website starting Monday, May 11th. You will receive an email notification when it's available. I encourage you to download the guide. It contains additional information not covered in today's webinar. We're gonna be doing a poll, a couple polls during the webinar. I'm gonna start our first one now. All right, so um, our first poll, the purpose of this is to help us tailor the presentation based on your areas of feedback and focus. So um, we hope to get some responses here. I see stuff coming in. We're just gonna give you another couple of seconds. We hope this is gonna be an informative and entertaining event. Like many of you, we're all working from home. So we apologize in advance if we encounter some technological issues along the way. We certainly hope that we don't, but by now we all know what it's like working remotely. So it looks like our results are in. 
And I'm just going to share the results. Right. Looks like um, a lot of CPG, packaged food, beverage, or personal care, um, some ingredient manufacturers, consultants. Good. All right. Today's presenters are Ludie Marche and Emily Halleck. Ludie leads the Glambia Nutritionals Global Insight Team, bringing over 15 years of experience in the CPG world from across Europe and North America to her role. Emily specializes in the creation and execution of quantitative and qualitative research methods on the food and beverage industry. At this time, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Ludie to start today's presentation. Ludi, it's all yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So let's click next and let's go into the presentation. Today, we are going to talk about nutrition and how generations have um, made, you know, like the change within the nutrition. So first, I would like to talk to you about the trends. And why do trends matter? Well, because they either can fuel growth or they can hinder the growth. But timing is key. So if you look into those examples below, you remember in 1973, Xerox was the first one to actually invent the PC, but they just forgot to do anything with it. I think that that one about 75, everybody knows that Kodak in Germany did uh, create uh, the the, the digital camera, but their management told them to put them into the closet. So another good example is Blockbuster. Did you know like a, um, Netflix wanted to be bought by Blockbuster? And the CEO was thinking at the time, well, you know what? Online streaming is a very small niche. So, and the last one is about Yahoo. Yahoo had the opportunity to buy Google for $1 million to buy Facebook, to buy YouTube, and to buy Microsoft. And none of the things happened because you know what? Timing was not key. Now, my last comment, and I think it's going to be very shocking for a lot of people because I just personally learned that news recently. Did you know that the Apple Watch outsold the entire Swiss watch industry in 2019? And how did this happen? Well, you know, the Apple Watch is only like a five-year industry. And at the time, what did people say? Well, it's a niche, right? It's only for tech who have a lot of money and this is not going anywhere. So I'm sure like in addition of the Apple Watch, many of you have like a smart, smart fitness or so therefore it's not surprising that the Swiss market is not going as strong. So as much as I would like to tell you that our trends are going to be as breakthrough as the Apple Watch, we are going to focus today more into the food and um, nutrition industry. But what I really hope that you will think about is that when you see those trends, either you are already working on them or you will think to yourself, well, what, what will happen if I'm not getting into those, you know, like trends? So let me just start about how are we getting, you know, like uh, into those mega trends? Where did we get those? So it has been like after countless of hours of research and readings and thanks to our fantastic partners that we are working with every day, we came up with what we call our mega trends in food and nutrition. And today we are going to introduce you to our five mega trends. The first one is about Generation Me. It is no longer enough today to just discuss about the four generations. So we are going to break them a little bit down so then you can provide better, proper marketing for your brands. The second one is about building the lifestyle. Consumers have a lot of food choices every day and they know exactly what they want and they are telling you what they want. The third one is about ultra personalization. I'm special and my brand knows it. So it's really about being like very consumer centric. The fourth one is about sustainability. So whether it's coming from blockchain to food waste or activism, you need to be on top of each of those trends. And last but not least, uh, this is about the sensational. We have all five senses, so let's do not be stingy. So the first one, we just talk about the generation me. 
And as we just said, we need to break them down as a little deeper level so we understand better the set of influences and personalization that we can do to that generation. But first, we need to go back to the basics so about those boomers. Who are there? The boomers, the Gen X, the millennials, and Gen Z. It's not surprising that globally, Gen Z is the largest, uh, largest representation with 37% globally. In the US, everybody talks about millennials. Yeah, 28%. But looks next to it, uh, the boomers are 26%. And boomers have a lot of money too. So this is not something that to forget. What I think is interesting about the male and female ratio is that the boomer is the um, category with the number of um, the number of time of women. So this is like a, a big one too. So now we want to talk about the technologies because the technology really, oops, I, think I click one too many. The technology is really affecting how you can convince those uh, consumers. So. We will see a lot of similarities, you know, across those groups and some that are different. But one thing that's absolutely different is really the technology and how you try to convince those people. Because if you talk to a boomer or a millennial, you know, the millennials will be very into like Facebook and Instagram and the other generation may not be. So you really cannot like one size fit all doesn't work. Um, you see about the current device, like there is no blurry line between, you know, like all of, all of those. It's because those generation, they are like using everything. And my last favorite quote of this is the least favorite generation. So when this consumer survey was asked, they say, what is your least favorite generation? Everybody answer millennials, even the millennials themselves. So let's just talk a little bit about now those micro generations and who they are. You have like uh, many of them, two for the boomers, two for the Gen X, three for the millennials, three for the, and two for the Z tribe. And you see here through the screen, the gig economy, the work life, you see like patterns, you know, like where it's flipping from one to the other, where it's not like uh, continuously because you can start to see that it's about the generation, but about the children and the parents. So if your parents, you know, like were into like recession, you will be as impacted as they will. But if you're not, then, you know, like you will be more into like work balance or wellness. The one that I want to call out at the bottom is about redefining age. And I would say like even at Mintel, they are just even calling it pro aging because we've heard a lot about, yeah, you know, I want to launch a product for my healthy aging and, you know, Millennials will come to me and they say, well, you know, like, uh, I would like to, to, to target like 55 plus. And my answer to them will be like, do you really think that the 55 plus wants to be called like healthy aging? No. And actually it's a total different generation now. So, but then the one that you can see like on the very right end, it's that the Gen Z as well wants to be like about the pro aging because they are a very educated crowd and they also want to proactively anticipate what's going to happen to them like in the future. So I'm going to, and you will see like the next slide is a very busy slide and I'm going to skip that slide. I will give the details for the people here who will have the patience to download the guide that we are going to provide next week because I don't want to explain too much about each of those crowd if you don't care. And I know like some of you may say, yeah, I'm only going to target the nouveau millennials or the neo millennials. But what I want to do in the rest of this presentation, it's to convince you about the why you should be caring about those generations. So to make your life easier, we have like a put like into one words about, you know, like each of those generation. But now let me like show you an example. And before we do so, I'm going to ask Emily to open the poll. Uh, so we have started like a, our own um, COVID survey, but before we do that, I would like to tell you that uh, which, so this is, this is our poll, which micro generation do, do you think are more likely to be currently purchasing their grocery via click and collect? And for those who are not familiar with click and collect is, you know, like you buy online and you go to the store to pick up your article. So I'm going to see, and Emily, you tell me how long we're going to like, yeah, where, so, you know, like um, what I want, the reason I want to focus about the click and collect, it's because um, in Europe, this is something that is extremely developed. 
and it has been for many years. And that's not really like um, uh, something like it's kind of like new for the US. So I think you will be very surprised by the result. So Emily, can we close the poll? Okay, great. So yeah, let's see, let's see like the new nouveau millennials, the pro millennials, and the Gen X. So basically, you are saying that each of those groups are using, you know, like the click and collect. So now let's go to the next page. Uh, I don't know how I'm taking. Okay, so I'm going back. Uh, so now I want to talk to you about our COVID survey. We have decided, you know like many other people to do our own COVID survey. And the reason, and there is like already fantastic resources that we get from Mintel, Data Central, um, Innova, many other market research company, but we wanted to tailor our survey to uh, our own business. And, you know, I want to say that we started very agile because we started our week one with the week that we sell like the panic buy. You know, remember that week when everything was out in the entire stores? So like from March 15 to March 22nd in the US. And then we've been doing this survey with 400 consumers every week. So we have a very robust survey, like every single week since then. But for the purpose of this webinar, we have chosen just like a, a few questions and, uh, and, and we're going to focus just on those. And therefore, we are going to compare the week one with what we call the week six. And the week six was between like April 20th uh, in eight, you know, like April 20th to 26 in eight states. So the first question was like, which product have you purchased within the past week? And we asked that same question like every single week. So it's not surprising that, you know, like you see like staples, uh, like bread, fresh meat and milk, you know, like to be like across each of those groups. But you can see already, and here I'm going to emphasize like a few things, is that uh, the patterns of the millennials is very different from the one, you know, like from the other, from the other groups. So um, here it is. Guess what this category is? This category is snacking. Isn't it shocking? So, well, maybe it's not shocking that as the number one, the millennials are, you know, like a, the, like specifically like the mid millennials are taking snack as their number one category. But what's really shocking is that six weeks later, or I should say five weeks later, now you're getting into the gen Xenos, you know, like to get more into snacking and also like the pro millennials. So I, I'm very eager to see what the survey is going to tell us next week, because, you know, like I'm sure like we'll see like more and more, you know, like a, a consumer going into snacking. The second one that we want to talk about is about the shopping. And this is the questions that we asked you at the beginning about the click and collect. So what was the first, at the first week, what did people do? And most of the thing, the first week, I would say they did like what they did like regularly is that they did their uh, regular like uh, in shop, in store shopping and some categories, you know, like did also some online. But what's interesting is really like to see like on the week six, and I don't know if you can see the subtlety of some of the, you know, like uh, icons, but now the people, while well, here they were getting delivery, now they are getting like the click and collect. And the click and collect, you know, like the neo boomers and the Gen Xs and also the nouveau millennials, they have converted into that click and collect. What I think is also interesting to see here is the uh, leading boomer because if you look into those percentages it was kind of like already shocking to see that so many people already were already buying online and I think that maybe that's not surprising because the leading boomer who are answering our survey are uh, people who um, are already savvy with internet <laughs> so maybe that group may be a little bit skewed but you can see where I am going so now I would like to talk to you about uh, a second uh, um, thing that was important for us, and it's the vitamins and minerals and supplements world, because you know, like we play a lot into that world. So for that one, we didn't ask, actually we did ask, what did you purchase last week? But most importantly, what did you consume? Because as for the one who works into the supplement industry, you know that consumers do not buy um, supplements every week. However, they consume it every week. So here you can see what did they what did they what did they consume? 
And you can see already like in week six, how the shift has done where so many more people are consuming. But now you will say, okay, Ludi, that's great, but what did they consume? So we ask, you know, like in terms, what type of benefits are you taking, you know, like those supplements? And the first one, it's not surprising to see like a general health was, you know, like among everybody. And then depending on the each micro generation, bone health, our hair, etc. But the second, you know, like interesting fact, and I think that a lot of people are asking about this today, it's about immunity. And now you can see like how, so some of the groups were already taking some immunity supplements, but now many more groups like are really shifted. If you want, we have like many more details in our customer consumer survey, you know, like uh, but this is really like the, the most important one. The last one I want to talk to you about is about exercise, you know, because lots of our customers today are within sports nutrition and active lifestyle. So we wanted to understand, are you maintaining your workout uh, exercise routine? And of course here, it's not like we removed like um, going to the gym, but it's kind of obvious that even like on the week one, the gym at the time were already closed. So that's why you cannot see. Otherwise, of course, you will have seen, you know, like the gym everywhere. But what you can see is really like there is a huge shift, you know, like from the week one to week six on each of those groups. And then there is surprisingly something up, you know, going to that, you know, like a, uh, to, 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 to the younger millennial. And I was talking to one of my team members and she said, you know, like now that I don't have to commute anymore, I'm spending more time, you know, like doing exercise. So I think this was like a, a great answer that could be like a, maybe understood here. So, you know, between the snacking that we saw on the first page and the people are doing legs exercising, one of our customers told them, yeah, we want to understand when our people are going to be on diet, you know? It doesn't seem like, unfortunately, it's going to be anytime soon. However, what we notice is that in our survey, we have a lot of so like uh, ready to drink drinks, you know, including high protein. And we are seeing like a new type of consumer that may be more like the one that we call like inactive and healthy eating that are taking those proteins because people like me, you know, I'm not exercising, but now I have access to my kitchen 24 seven. So I have time in the morning to do like a shake or something that I was not doing before. So we really see like some of the shift of the consumer. The last thing I would like to talk about is about food service because in food service, you know, like I'm sure like lots of you who are in food service know like how dramatic the situation is with the travel. I think it's one of the worst. And, and, and we want to see when things are going to come up. And you can see that fast food or QSR is the number one category that everybody is going, you know, like eating, which is not surprising. But now there is definitely like a shift between fast casual and, you know, fast casual will be something like Panera bread or like a casual dining. Casual dining will be more like, like the pizzeria that's, you know, like our Italian place that close to your place. And you will see like at the end of this presentation, I have like a, I'm hoping like a happy story to relate to about food service and how some, you know, like a, uh, like somebody in fine dining was able to get, you know, like a good business out of uh, uh, the COVID-19. So now I'm going to talk to you about our second trend, which is building a lifestyle. We say like whether it is to looking for functional benefits for an active lifestyle or to get cleaner ingredients, there is like a lot of choices that consumers are looking every day. Cleaning level, better for you, vegetarian, flexitarian, functional benefits. So let's try to debunk them one by one. The first one is about clean label. The question is that, well, what is the definition of clean label? And yesterday we were in a webinar with Mintel and they just reconfirmed that there is no actually definition for clean label. Clean label is only what the consumer think it is. So anybody can come up with the best definition in the world, but that will not help because that's really what consumer thinks. The second thing is about the better for you. And 80% of consumer agree that healthy eating is about a balance and not a restriction. So today you may go to get, you know, like some burger and french fries, but because you're adding a fruit salad, that's okay, right? It's the same, I guess, for the, you know, like for the uh, snacking category or some product that you can definitely like some good example, I think has been, and I think kind, you know, where they really like have like super clean. And then there is a lot of other categories that they were able to get into like the better for you because just adding 
high protein, reducing the sugar, I mean, eliminating almost the sugar, that made those products, you know, like a very, like a much better for you. Oops, just breathing now, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now let's talk about plant versus animal. And there has been like a lot of um, discussion about, you know, people are confused about plant-based. I mean, people are not confused about plant-based, but let's say like there is now a lot of different type of plant base. So we wanted to create like, this is a fantastic chart that we got from Hartman, where they kind of spell out, okay, what do consumers think and what do they know and they don't know? So, you know, like um, the high level of familiarity will be your regular soy paddy that, you know, like has been in the industry forever, that even before any of us on this call were into this industry. The second category that has been emerging is about the animal plant, plant blends. You know, like where you are reducing the amount of meat and you're like adding like quinoas or, you know, like a, a more vegetables. So this one is could be really targeted to the one that we call like flexitarian. And by the way, in case you don't know what a flexitarian is, a flexitarian is, you know, like somebody who used to be like an omnivore, but has drastically reduced their consumption for a different type of reasons and we're going to go to the reasons on the next slide the next one is i think that the one that everybody think about when we talk about you know like plant based with the meat like fully plants like beyond burger or sweet hers so those category they really want to replicate you know like the meat meat like juiciness even they put it into the package so this is clearly to attract you know like the omnivore and the flexitarian and by the way we just did like a, a recent survey about uh, that target group because we have like one offering and uh, it was crystal clear that the people who are buying most of those categories, except maybe the first one, are flexitarian and omnivore and they represent about 80% if I recall well, because just to again be this in mind is the fact that vegetarian and vegans are still like 4% each of the population. But now I think that the most like a breaking through innovation in that space is really like about the cellular or lab grown meats. And if you think about just, and if you do recall a few years ago, and I was at Kraft at the time, so I recall very well because they had launched just mayo. Do you remember that one? Well, people at Kraft remember very well because it was not mayo, but they call it mayo. So um, now they are going into like, you know, like this uh, cellular based meat. And today it's a niche, a niche, you know, that again, any of us should be looking into. And they are able to replicate chicken that really looks like chicken. A few months ago, I was able to try their just egg that really looks like just egg. Today, the just chicken is about like $10,000 per pound. So they are think they know that they are convinced and they are getting a lot of money for this, either themselves or Memphis, you know. So because they are planning to sell those type of categories for less than ten dollars per pound within the next few years. But then you will say, okay, but the why? You know, like why are those people are using plant based? Is it because it's like uh, ethical or is it because of you know like health and wellness? I'm going to disappoint you a little bit because it's about all of the reasons. So the number one reason is about I like the taste. And by the way, I like the taste is for any single product. You know, again, according to Mintel, is that every time a consumer chooses a product, it's because it tastes good. And it's also about the price, you know, like the price for value for money. And it's also about the flavors. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there are lots of variety of reasons why, you know, consumers are looking into like at the plant base. Now, what I, can, what I can tell you is that the one, and you see like this over index of 143, this is for the Gen Z. So while everybody out of our generations are looking for, you know, like each of those type, there is definitely like the Gen Z are more through ethical and belief reason. And the reason where, I like the companies that make this product and want to support them. Other people that I respect are doing, you know, are eating them basically. But then when we look into the questions one by one, you can see like the first reason people, and you can see every generation is the same. The first reason was the taste. So the way you can really differentiate yourself, I think is with the second one, you know, like a millennials will be more like towards the variety. I want variety in my diet with 27, 25%. 
or you can see the boomer at the end, which are like, you know, uh, they have less fat or less cholesterol with 24%. So now we want to talk about the healthy, the positively nutrition. What healthy means today? I'm sure some of you may have seen that chart already from Data Central, but I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal chart about explaining what has happened through those years. In the 80s, it was 1.0, weight management, low fat, low cal, low carbs. And did you remember like from my previous page where the boomers were into like the no cholesterol, low carbs, etc.? This is definitely this target. At the beginning of the 2000s, and this is also when we started to see like the plant-based movement, it's about, you know, the feel good, local, natural, free from. And then in the 2000s, it's about the functional foods. It's about performance, superfoods, positive nutrition. Well, you know, like look at us because we are specifically like into the food, food, uh, uh, functional food industry. But here I would like to show you an example of food service. And let me put like all those slides. But if you know that, do you know that all the trends or most of the trends in retail come from food service? And Data Central has created something fantastic called like the menu adoption cycle. And they are saying that basically all the trends are coming from inception, fine dining, mixology, you know, like uh, the earlier stage, and then they grow through adoption, proliferation, ubiquity. And in the past, between those, and you know, think about incep inception like fine dining, and then ubiquity like McDonald's or even like Walmart supermarkets. So before it was taking 10 years to go from one phase to the other, now it's a matter of five. So I know many of you would like to see like on this chart, you know, like lots of details. So this is part of our guide as well, you know, that you can absolutely download. The last thing I would like to talk about, uh, about the, this positively nutrition is about the tracking. So you may have heard about this app called like personalized nutrition from Food, Food Educate, where basically you can scan your product and they're going to give a score and they're going to tell you what is that product has in terms of, you know, like number of um, uh, additives or is it like the number of calories, etc. So it's giving you like a great. In Europe, they are going one step further. And some of you may have heard about what we call like the Nutri-Score, which is the logo that now you need to put onto your packaging. So if any of my um, um, fellow friends from inside, they would know that in inside, like in Europe, you have to know about your Nutri-Score. It's not a surprise that because today it's not mandatory, it's just optional, a lot of companies do not put their score if they are on D and E. So therefore, when you go into the shelf, like, and you see, like, and you say, hey, I want to take in on like a snack, the one that will have a score of A and B are like super healthy to the point that sometimes then the taste may not be good enough, right? And, and also the consumer knows because he knows that if he takes like an indulgent packet, you know, he knows that it's a D and E, and it's okay, because you remember like when we say about the better for you, as long as most of the time you eat well, then you can enjoy, indulge yourself, you know, like with one of the things. But now it gets a little bit, it goes a little bit further in Europe because you have this other app called Yuka, which has been adopted by more than 15 million people over there, which is massive for Europe. So now you're scanning your product, you know, that's the right slide, and now it's giving you an option for the green one. So that's becoming like, no, you should be choosing this instead of that. And I was reading an article two days ago from the CEO of Danone, who said like, it is our responsibility to talk about the Nutri-Score and specifically within the COVID pandemic because health matter. So <clears throat> my, last, my two last points are about the functional benefits. So we talked about the benefits earlier, uh, but, you know, like we ask our friends at Mintel, specifically like in the functional, with, with the functional beverages, 43% of consumer, first of all, shop by need and then by ingredients. So, and I think that a lot of companies like have started to like put like really like the benefits on the package instead of, you know, like the ingredients, which is great. But then when we talk about specifically the beverage one, 62% consider, believe that beverage play an important role in your health and wellness. And 44% consumer prefer their beverages to have something, and this is from Hartman, right? Something being functional. So therefore, we ask our friends at Mintel about what's the best beverages. And from one of their recent study, 
they will tell you that 52% of consumer wants to get high protein, 50% hydration, energy, hyd um, digestive health, brain health, etc. Last but not least, and sorry, Emily, you will kill me because I'm saying I'm a few minutes behind. We want to talk about the share economy. The share economy is about the community garden. So maybe, of course, if, be, because of COVID today, it may be on pause. But then you've got like this fantastic app called Olio, where you can share, you know, like the app that lets you share unwanted food item with your neighbors. So think about it. Emily, this is all yours. Thanks, Ludi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Emily, and I will be covering off on our last three mega trends. The first of which is ultra personalization. So, in ultra personalization, we're talking about the prioritization of personalization over a you know one size fits all model. Um, as we see in, Mintel, in Mintel's trend, Make It Mine, the ability for consumers to have some sort of input into what they buy has crossed every industry and nearly every part of the globe. Um, it's the very pervasiveness of customization that makes the trend what it is today, an expectation, and one that consumers simply just won't do without. So when it comes to nutrition, science is backing up desires for personal nutrition with facts. Uh, in a study presented in June 2019 at the American Society of Nutrition Conference, global leading scientific researchers announced evidence that different people, even identical twins, have different responses and preferences when it comes to food. Researchers report that their findings show a one-size-fits-all dietary guideline is just too simplistic and a personalized approach to nutrition will provide better long-term health benefits for consumers. So how do consumers expect this personalization to materialize in the food and beverage industry, I think is the question. That's by using digital technology, artificial intelligence, nostalgic concepts in marketing, personalized diets, and even convenient solutions, which all fit into our mega trend of ultra personalization. There we go. Can I go back here? Sorry. Let me take it back. Back. Moira, if you could get me back one slide, that would be great. I can't see our, our buttons here. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So in our digital customization and artificial intelligence mini trend, we're focusing on how these technologies can produce agile and predictive new product development streams and marketing strategies. There are challenges and benefits to using digital technology and AI in this way, with the challenges primarily centered around things like speed of production and logistics. Um, but the benefits just might outweigh the costs of establishing new manufacturing ecosystems. They really heavily resonate with consumers in things like reduced waste, sustainability, and transparency. Here we see Gatorade's smart cap tracking technology that utilizes real-time hydration tracking to optimize sports performance. We see Care Of's personalized pill packs that utilize a digital survey to customize the supplement mix. And then we see London's restaurant Vita Mojo that gives customers nutritional guidance based on their genetics, a DNA genetic test. In our nostalgia, uh, mini trend in our ultra personalization mega trend, we see that nostalgia can be a powerful and efficient tool for tapping into what consumers love or even used to love about a brand. In order to stay ahead of the market, brands must carefully balance this kind of nostalgic aspect as well as tapping into more modern platforms to maintain a cross generational appeal. We see this in products like Danone 1919, which is using the original Danone yogurt recipe, or Magic Spoon cereal, which is kids cereal for adults, or even when Bon Appetit's test kitchen recreates foods from your childhood like Gushers or Kit Kats using an all natural approach with things that maybe everyone might have in their kitchen. Another great example is the resurrected Twinkies brand introducing new flavors and affiliations with the likes of Ghostbusters and Minions, taking something old and making it new again. Now, our third mini trend in ultra personalization is ways of eating. And we've already seen how consumers' eating habits and perspectives have changed from 1.0 weight management 
to 3.0 functional foods, which Ludi already discussed. But now we'd like to explore 4.0 personalized foods. It's a relatively recent way of thinking about food and eating that goes beyond just being functional, but it's personalized to each consumer's biology and isn't only better for them, but can be better for the environment as well. So we'll look at this idea of personalized foods. It's natural to think about, you know, where currently trending diets fit in. So here we're using Data Central's menu adoption cycle, and we see that diets like paleo or the DASH diet are still in the inception phase, meaning that penetration is pretty low, but there's buzz surrounding them. Then we see diets like the keto diet or Whole30 that are in this adoption phase cycle, which indicates a larger number of consumers are adopting the diet, but when we click through to the proliferation uh, section of the cycle and ubiquity, we don't yet see any of these diets in these phases. Essentially, that just means they haven't yet reached the point where as many people are using them as they could, um, and they're not as prolifer they're not as prolific in the population, essentially. Now, in order to keep uh, kind of our listener engagement alive, we're going to do another poll here. And what we would like to know, let me start our poll for you. This is a single select, so you only get one choice here. We'll launch our poll. But what we want to know is, what do you think will be the next diet trend after keto? You just get to choose one, and your options are paleo, intermittent fasting, vegan, or the Mediterranean diet. And we'll give everyone a, just a minute here to, to vote, because I genuinely want to see what you all think is going to be our next big diet trend that we need to keep an eye out for in the, in the industry. All right, we do have the majority of people voted, so let's see what we said. Interesting, cool. So 58% of people are saying intermittent fasting, um, which is great, and I will show you why. We'll pat back into our presentation here. Because here we're looking, uh, this is essentially data from a survey that we're, we see the percentage of Americans who have tried each of these different diets in 2019. After the low carb and dairy elimination diets, intermittent fasting is the most common type of eating approach tried by US consumers. So you guys were, the majority of you were right um, with intermittent fasting in our, our poll question. Um, we would like to highlight some generational differences here as well, kind of in keeping with the theme of our generational lens. Um, and what we see is boomers, unfortunately, don't over-index on any of these ways of eating or diets. But when we get to Gen X, we see them over-indexing on our low-carb diet, which makes sense. Gen X came of age when carbs were being vilified in the market, and that's something that has kind of sat with them, and that's leading to them uh, trying these low carb ways of eating. Now, when it comes to millennials and Gen Z, they're over indexing on the majority of all of these other diets, which can be useful to know only in developing uh, and marketing new products and that support these ways of eating. So it's, you wanna know who your target market is, and that's gonna be millennial and Gen Z for the majority of these kind of new ways of eating or diets. We've been talking a lot about keto. I know, you know that's kind of a new big trend, but that's still only around 5% of the population that eats you know, the keto way as of 2019, no matter how trendy we might think it is out in the industry right now. So we'll dig a little bit deeper here into intermittent fasting, seeing as how 9% of our population in the United States in 2019 has tried intermittent fasting. And we, as we already discussed, we think it's intermittent fasting that will kind of become the next keto. Now, why is that? It's because when evaluating trends, it's important to note that new trends are often built on the existing foundation provided by earlier trends. My slide didn't advance on here. Hold on a second. There we go. And that's what we can see happening here with the keto diet. So the benefits of the keto diet are counted as weight loss, mental clarity, and energy. And those are also the foundational benefits of intermittent fasting. However, this diet also provides the added benefit of reduced inflammation and digestive health. So you're taking intermittent fasting and building off of that foundation of keto, but introducing these other ben benefits as well, like reduced inflammation and digestive health. We'd also like to point out a few opportunities that nutrition companies, I know not everyone on the call today is a nutrition company, but if you are, 
these are some opportunities that you could tap into in order to access the intermittent fasting trend. You can create supplements with nutrients specific to those that are lost during a fasting or a weight loss diet. You can create beverages that are suitable for people who are fasting or maybe are coming off of a fast fasting period. And you can also create sports performance drinks that would be consumed before or during a workout that's performed while fasting. That's known as a fasted workout and gets them those nutrients that their body is craving. Now, since the sequencing of the human genome, there's been a lot of interest in nutrigenomics. That is the scientific study of the interaction of nutrition and genes. It's long been clear that we don't all respond the same way to the same dietary interventions. Some people do really well on a high fat diet, while others on the same diet develop tri high tri triglycerides or high cholesterol. Some people lose more weight when they reduce carbs. Others lose more weight when they increase complex carbs and reduce fat. But we see Genopalette is one of several companies who are helping consumers understand this and then learn how to best eat for their genetic makeup. Based on a simple DNA analysis, Genopalette provides an extensive look at the types of foods and nutrients that your body prefers or is sensitive to. Are you the type of person who can't drink anything with caffeine past noon? Or, are you the, or can you drink a cup of coffee and then fall fast asleep? I fall into the second category. Um, your DNA though may hold the answer and that's something that Genopalette can disclose for you. In the next decade, we expect consumers will be able to gain a more in-depth knowledge of their biology through their personal health testing kits and these DNA kits that are really gonna empower them to personalize their diet and their health regimes. Um, analysis of these tools will inform consumers of the steps that they need to take in order to address almost every aspect of their health. And that's also including brain and emotional health. So don't forget about those. As a result, brands will need to offer more personalized product offerings and explore how to help consumers address this kind of mood, brain, uh, physical health as more consumers are considering mental health alongside diet and exercise in their personal health management style. Over the next 10 years, consumers will be able to easily access and afford this customized biological information, this data collection and analysis that helps them learn what makes their bodies one of a kind. The results will help consumers better understand how to address every aspect of their health, including their brain and emotional health. So while respecting consumer privacy, food and drink companies will have opportunities to develop personalized recipes, maybe custom diet plans or individualized products. Companies really should, here in this instance, should serve as facilitators on this journey to kind of a healthier lifestyle. Food and beverage companies that recognize that opportunity early on to kind of help consumers understand their data and facilitate those effective purchases are going to be the ones who win. Here we have a few examples for you. Vita Mojo, which we earlier discussed, was the first food service chain to give customers nutritional guidance based on their genetics. So in the food service space, you walk into a, you know, this is a fast casual establishment and you can walk in and they'll give you suggestions based on what your body needs or what it's lacking, what you're sensitive to. We see the Explorado market that supports those that are following the ketogenic diet. It's an entire grocery store that provides only keto friendly products. And then we see the Marley Mellow Mood peach raspberry relaxation tea that features mood enhancing botanicals that are said to calm the soul and ease the mind. Definitely focusing on that brain and mental health here. Convenience is the last mini trend of our ultra personalization mega trend. We see rising internet penetration, denser urban locations, faster paced lifestyles, challenging working hours. They're all adding more and more layers of complexity to consumers' lives right now. And according to the World Health Organization, workplace stress is the health epidemic of the 21st century. Multiple agencies have tracked the steady rise of anxiety related illnesses around the world, and consumers are just feeling more stretched, stretched than ever and are increasingly striving for convenient solutions, which help to simplify these busy lives that they're leading. This point is illustrated that by 34% of consumers in North America saying that efforts to eat healthier are impacted by time scarcity and their reliance on convenience food. And that leads to us seeing things like a 10% increase versus a year ago in things like value added vegetables, things you can buy in the grocery store that are maybe pre-cut or pre-processed for you in some way, so you don't have to spend your valuable time in the kitchen 
chopping carrots and onions. It's done for you already. You can purchase those things in the grocery store. With that, we want to move on to our fourth mega trend, which is sustainability matters. In such a digital age, consumers are more educated than ever. And they're looking for brands and companies that communicate their corporate social responsibility story with complete transparency. Plastic and waste are rising to the top of the heap with consumers more focused than ever on developing a circular economy. They're not hesitating to use social media to shine a spot, spotlight on the good, the bad, and the ugly. These are things that we're gonna cover off in our sustainability matters mega trend here. Our little, there we go, little summary slide. So in sustainability matters, we're talking about sustainability not only as it pertains to the health of the environment, but it's also different consumer expectations that go along with it. So how can manufacturers win in the eyes of the consumer when it comes to putting their most sustainable foot forward? As you'll see, there's a, a bevy of different methods to choose from here, including circular economy systems, the use of blockchain technology, social media activism, uh, reducing waste using science and technology, and even just consumer education and complete transparency. So looking first at our circular economy mini trend, we highlight a, a number of products and services introduced recently that encourage consumers to think sustainably. So whether that's using used vegetable oil to fuel cars, using spent grain from the beer making process as the base ingredient in a snack bar, or choosing a biodegradable and compostable plastic alternative for their bottled water, options like this will only continue to be introduced as the concern for the environment increases from consumers. One of the most notable shifts to take hold recently is the replacement of single-use packaging with sustainable reusable alternatives. Companies like Loop are working to build the logistics and supply chain that would make a large-scale kind of milkman type model work on a nationwide basis. Companies like Hidden Valley, Hagen Dazs, and Tropicana have already jumped on board and are actually providing an option for eco-minded consumers to purchase their products in reusable packaging through this subscription-like model. Essentially, you go online and you purchase products that you would normally purchase anyway. There is a small fee associated with uh, the packaging. It's a, a returnable fee to you that if once you return the packaging, you get that money back. If you have a subscription that you just keep ordering it, essentially, you just that's money you've already put into your subscription like model. Um, and you just receive that on a weekly basis. Once you're done, you just rinse out your containers, put it back into the box and then have a schedule of pickup that can be uh, the cooler boxes picked up and then your new products are delivered to you. Um, so say you go through a lot of Hidden Valley Ranch. I know I do in my family. Once the bottle's empty, just give it a rinse. Hopefully you have your new shipment already on the way to you and then you schedule a pickup to pick up those uh, used bottles and they're sanitized, refilled and put back into, the, into this um, system. Now it seems that every year uh, there's some kind of recall on spinach or romaine or some other leafy green that's due mostly to E. coli outbreaks. And these recalls negatively impact not only retailers, but both from a, a customer satisfaction and brand image standpoint, um, but as well as from a, a profit perspective. So historically, it's been pretty difficult and time consuming for retailers to trace these products back to their source, often requiring maybe a week or more to determine the origin of those contaminated products. Blockchain technology has the ability to drastically reduce traceability time to minutes or even seconds, potentially reducing that retailer liability exposure and allowing them the ability to secure product from different suppliers, from different places, without the significant lag time normally associated with food recalls if something goes wrong. Other potential benefits of block blockchain traceability within the food and beverage industry include reduced food fraud, reduced food waste, improved consumer information, in increased food safety, increased profitability for food suppliers, and reduced costs for the consumer. So imagine a world where the fresh food that you purchase is tagged with a QR code, a quick scan with your smartphone could tell you where the food was grown, when it was picked, when and where it was processed, and how long it's been sitting on the shelf. Blockchain technology has the ability to drastically alter how we as consumers are purchasing and interacting with our food. In this social and digital age, consumers are also seeing their purchasing decisions 
as a form of activism. We say hashtag activism. They're voting with their dollars and they're supporting those companies that align with their personal beliefs and hopes for the future. Consumers are more likely to follow and engage with companies and brands and initiatives on social media that support their own beliefs. However, there is an opportunity to use social media as an agent for change. And that's what we're seeing from organizations like Slow Food or the American Grass-Fed Association. And they're using social media to educate and connect with consumers in hopes that their purchase patterns will change to reflect these kind of newly educated and newfound values. There we go. There we go. Uh, consumers are also hungry for leadership and demonstrable change in the envir on environmental issues, on ethical business practices, on public health, and other important causes. And I think right now is just really shining a light on all of that. Um, innovative ideas in this space include things like regrained, a snack bar that's made from repurposed spent grain, um, a transparent plastic substitute that's made from fish waste, things that normally would just be thrown away. And the city of Toronto that's actually switching their garbage truck fleet over to run on biogas that's actually produced by their own composting program. We're seeing, also seeing the resurgence of an older concept, bulk food stores. Shopping in bulk and bringing your own reusable containers is kind of in vogue again. And although these store concepts are facing, definitely facing some challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, consumer preference for this style of shopping is just gonna continue to rise um, after you know we're allowed back out into the world again, and we don't have such concerns over, um, over the COVID-19 disease and virus. In 2025, we expect brands to kind of prioritize people and the planet over profitability. Consumers are gonna increasingly reward those companies that make a difference with their, their loyalty in the coming years. So they're gonna choose to spend their money with companies that they see aligning with their own beliefs on this. Today, we also see a new agricultural revolution that's beginning. We think that by 2030, vertical farms, indoor hydroponic systems, robotic harvested farms, and other high-tech agricultural innovations are gonna increase the supply of fresh local fruits, vegetables, grains, even herbs. And today's priorities for clean label have caused many consum consumers to be wary of these kind of processed food and drink items. Scientific and technological innovations that offer fresh, trustworthy foods have to serve as ambassadors to start to sway consumer opinion away from that fear. Facing backlash, some brands have to pivot, you know, pivot that messaging in other, to other inherent advantages of engineered food and drink products. And that's especially when it comes to things like sustainability. It's very important to consumers. Food can learn from other industries that highlight the advantages of lab-grown. Outside of the food and drink industry, lab-grown's been positioned as uh, more ethical, more cost-effective, and even more efficient than naturally sourced options. Um, one of the kind of standout industries here is something like the diamond industry. Transparency of information, though, is essential in building trust with a future where scientists play an integral role, even as farmers. And championing the people behind the food, whether it's grown in a laboratory or in a field, will remain kind of that timeless way of building that trust with consumers. It's very, very important. In our last mini trend of our Sustainability Matters mega trend, we see that the consumer is changing. They're more capricious, they're less loyal, they have less time, they're more conscientious, they shy away from stores, um, and, but they prefer experiences over products. Today's consumer is just a completely different animal and unrecognizable from their peers of the good old days. No longer do consumers rely on marketing claims to inform them about what they should eat. Research is done in advance sometimes even at the store nowadays. And if claims are made on the label, consumers are now taking their time to educate themselves on what those claims mean for them, to understand what it means for them personally. This search for truth isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And you can bet that our hashtag activism mini trend plays a role here too. Consumers are kind of more willing than ever to find and share information on, on social media so we say, tell your story, tell it early and tell it often and encourage these sleuthy shoppers as we're calling them to dig even deeper. Now our last mega trend is what we call sensational. Taking familiar products and giving them a twist through color, flavor, texture, 
is a way for businesses to appeal to a larger consumer group while keeping up with niche specialty product products. So engaging the customer in a tactile way often makes them feel a stronger connection to the brand and the product, ultimately your company. In our sensational mega trend, we'll discuss ways in which brands can connect with consumers that utilize every one of the senses and then beyond. We even talk about emotion. We all know that the, in the world of food and beverage, taste is king, as Ludi mentioned earlier, but what other sensory experiences do consumers use to evaluate food and beverage products? Why do some of these trends go viral? How do you transform a viral trend into something that has more staying power? We'll take a look at the visual and emotional components, the textural experience, the bold flavors, and then products that also use a tactile integration in this mega trend. In this visual and Instagrammable age, we eat and judge with our eyes. I know that uh, probably more than some of you are on Instagram and definitely doing some judging and eating with your eyes. But three key points to keep in mind when thinking about in the Instagrammability of food include one, color. Color is being just wholly embraced and celebrated in the food industry right now and is used to stand out from the Instagram crowd. It's kind of setting yourself apart. Vibrant colors and edible glitters are continuously being added to food and drink products to make them more visually appealing. If, if it's visually appealing, you wanna take a picture of it and share it on Instagram and let all your friends know that you found this cool new product. That leads to number two, cool creativity. Instagram allows users to share creatively in a multitude of different ways. There's the written word, there's pictures, there's videos, you can go live, the list goes on, you can DM people, the channel is an excellent way for brands to be creative and inventive with the way that they're promoting their products and marketing to consumers. Then you have to think about sustainability stories as well. Like we said, find your story, tell it early, tell it often, but beyond the look and appearance of food, Instagram is also able to tell a story and inspire those looking for a sustainable lifestyle. So as a result, the provenance of food is more important than ever before as brands and consumers seek to support that drive towards sustainable food production. They'll connect with you on Instagram when you support the ways of thinking that they already have within them. When it comes to flavor, we find the bolder, the better. Consumers continue to expand their palates through experiencing the food of other cultures, and that familiarity has then led them to looking for these bold flavors in their own favorite food and beverages. We see that 66% of consumers in the US say that they're interested in Middle Eastern cuisine and restaurants. And as Ludi already mentioned, we know that that's where food trends are born. So companies are taking advantage of this fact. We see Oreo who launched their wasabi and their hot chicken wing flavored Oreos in 2018. Or we see Rethink Ice Cream, which is a better for you ice cream brand and it's cardamom pistachio flavor. These kind of new, bold, interesting flavors can reinvigorate a category and then entice consumers to buy, maybe buy something in addition to or instead of a product that they normally purchase. As we just discussed, adventurous consumers in, pursu in pursuit of new food experiences are on the rise, uh, but texture plays an important role in the discovery mindset as well. And consumers are responding strongly to products that have heightened sensory experiences that offer a greater feeling of indulgence. Um, according to Innova Market Research, 45% of US consumers are influenced by texture when buying food and drinks, while 68% share the opinion that textures contribute to a more interesting food and beverage experience. I don't know about you, but I would rather have an interesting food and beverage experience rather than a boring one. Uh, that intense physical and kind of sensory experience just works to give life to brands and products and really gives them a deeper meaning when it comes to consumers and how they internalize their interaction with those products. Now, values have pretty much everything to do with uh, your success, becoming market ready, getting the right shelf strategy, engaging the customers at the right time, in the right place with the right message, and then ultimately with driving more product sales and bottom line revenue. And brands that have identified their values in this way also tend to apply their values to each decision that they're making. They kind of bake those core beliefs into every product that they produce. They reference them with every retailer they pitch. They make them visible on every package at the shelf and they make them felt through every customer touch point, be it uh, advertising, catalogs, social media, or even on their website. 
Um, we see brands like Terra Chips and RX Bar and Halo Top that all belong to vastly different product categories, but have earned very similar successes. But what sets them apart really? What's their secret ingredient? And to find it, you have to look below the surface. Oh, we skipped ahead, it looks like. Moira, if you wanna pop us back two slides. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, regardless of those those food and beverage products, consumers are you know looking for that both that emotional and sensorial experience with an emphasis on that emotional experience. It makes them feel better about eating them. Ter you're eating Terra chips. You're not just eating regular potato chips. You're eating something that's better for you. Halo Top as well. You want to drown your sorrows in ice cream? You can eat the whole pint of Halo Top for only 320 calories. Really hits consumers on that emotional note. And lastly, but not least, in our sensational megatrend, we want to talk about the tactile experience. Uh, Physics Sparkling Cold Brew Coffee is described as the first self-chilling can available in the public in the United States. The chill can containers are purchased at ambient temperature, so they're not refrigerated, and then they're chilled when they're ready to consume. When you twist the bottle of the can, the bottom of the can, the technology automatically chills the can and the beverage inside using reclaimed CO2. Think about uh, when you're cleaning off your computer, um, your computer keyboard with compressed air. That's essentially the technology that they're in, enacting there. Then we see Karma Wellness Water, and that's described as a truly enlightened product that transformed pristine sparkling water into wellness water, creating positive effects for your mind, body, spirit, balance, and vitality. Karma's ingredients are kept in what they call a karma cap until you're ready to mix them. So you can enjoy all their benefits at maximum potency. It's kept dry apart from the water. You just push down on the cap and that releases all the goodness in there and then you just give it a nice little shake. Providing this kind of tactile integration can work to draw consumers to your product, but also it cements your product in the mind of consumers as the experience goes beyond what they normally would go through when drinking a beverage. It really kind of keeps that product top of mind when they're thinking about what they want as a beverage in the future. That concludes our Glambia Nutritionals mega trends that we had prepared for you today. But what I'll do is I'll pass it back to Ludi for what she uh, referenced earlier, but a timely and quite relevant example here for her. Thank you, Emily. Um, am I taking next? Okay, so this example is about food service. I don't know if any of you heard about Talk. But basically, it's an app similar to open table the only difference is the fact that you have to either do like a down payment or a prepayment in advance this is most of the time mainly for the um fine dining and they call it like a true culinary experience you know so you are not going to find like a smaller like a restaurant but that's very fancy and if you ever like travel to a different city you know like you'll be able to just by not knowing where to go you just go to that app what has been amazing is that because this app is global, the CEO of the company, when he saw like the downturn of the economy and in food service in Hong Kong, they said, we have to do something. So they were able to add the talk to go to the environment and the, to, to talk to go, sorry, which is like a, a, an, an ability. And let me click on the next slide. Voila, no hidden fees. Developed in less than a week in March for the global fine dining. So we stuck to go. You can offer meals for delivery or pickup. It's easy, fast, and safe for your site, staff and guests alike. And in a company like Alinea, as you may have heard, which is like a, a three-star Michelin in Chicago, one of the top restaurants in the world, thanks to that app, they were able to keep like 75% of their entire revenue, which is unbelievable. But most importantly, they have allowed, you know, like other like small restaurants to use that app you know, like, so they are giving back to the community. Now, I want to talk to you about my experience because Alinea actually had like a fantastic deals for like six courses for $49 this week because it's their 15 years anniversary. For those who know like a three star Michelin restaurant, you are more like in a range of like a $300. So I tried and the last, you know, like a meal was about their dessert table. And they tell you after like the four pages of, you know, like a explanation uh, of the menu and how to reheat and which of course you cannot use the microwave, but you know, they say, okay, so if you want to understand how to prepare the dessert table, 
you need to Google, you know, or go to Instagram to get this. So this is the picture that I found, you know, like when I was trained. So now I'm going to be very like um, uh, authentic. This is me and my kids trying, you know, like this recipe. So you see like on the left, I'm not at all creative person, but I think he really enjoyed the art. And then he got, you know, like a, he enjoyed it very much. So the point I'm making here is that that talk to go that was developed in one week, first of all, it's really helping the communities. Then it's hitting on all the trends because even when you see my experience here, you know, like at the table, that's exactly the sensational, you know, like that Emily was saying. And if you know about, you know, like uh, if you remember that Airbnb and Uber were created like in a downtime uh, in 2019, uh, 2008, sorry. I'm really hoping that, you know, like talk to go will do like some research and they'll say, well, maybe there's an opportunity to keep, you know, like this type of app after COVID. So voila, I think that this concludes and maybe we can go into questions. I know like we had the webinar planned for like, um, uh, one hour and 15 minutes. I've seen like a few questions. I don't know, Myra, do we have time for any questions or? Absolutely, yeah, why don't you? Okay. I think so, Emily was gonna look at for some too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll pick one, you pick one. <laughs> uh, the first one I saw, why have you consumed in the millennials, why have you consumed VMS? Millennials have huge boost in digestive health. Reasons, is it stress? But that's a good question. First of all, what I mean to say about this uh, weekly survey that we did, we did it in a very agile way that we didn't think about it for two weeks, you know, like we did right away the first week. And then when we thought that we wanted to add one more question every week because we really like wanted, you know, like to be like more nimble on this one. So we don't have the why yet into the survey, but I think it's a great addition that we could add, you know, like for our next survey. Emily, do you want to yeah. take another one? Yeah, um, I might just kind of, it's not a twofer, but one is pretty easy. Uh, there's one question about um, seeing intermittent fasting leapfrogging keto, since keto is only at that 5% penetration, whereas intermittent fasting is already at 9%. Now, keep in mind, um, those that data is uh, percent of U.S. consumers who have tried it, so not necessarily that they're sticking with it. But I think one of the things that intermittent fasting um, is doing really well and we might see it kind of leapfrog you know keto and come to the forefront is that it doesn't necessarily make you alter the way and what you're eating um, that much right now you know keto is a complete overhaul of how most people eat and uh, what they're putting into their bodies intermittent fasting is just you don't eat for a certain number of hours and then you have a period of unrestricted eating so it's very easy for consumers to one to kind of try it and see to jump in and out of it, but also uh, to follow it and it doesn't take them away from their normal diet. Um, I also saw one about, um, you know, COVID-19 and, and package, reusable packaging um, and thoughts on that continuing because Starbucks just, you know, I think the, they said did away with re refillable cups. I think, I believe, I don't know for sure, but I believe that's just during this time period. I don't think that we are going to see a resurgence in um, individual packaging for the long term. Maybe right now in order to get through this kind of COVID pandemic, um, but there is so much information and education of consumers that reusable is better for the planet and that plastic throw away. But we're also seeing, you know, um, like the, the transparent plastic substitute that's made with fish waste. It's completely biodegradable, 100% compostable, and things like that are going to become options for single serve packaging. I don't think we're going to see single serve packaging go away completely, but we're, it's gonna, definitely going to see a change in how uh, consumers expect that packaging to be made, not with plastic, ideally. Okay, so I'll go. If there is a significant economic downturn due to COVID-19, job loss, do you see a radical arrangement of the trends in the future? Actually, not our mega trends because the way we build them, you know, there may be definitely like a shift in the brands that consumers are going, you know, to buy. And to that matter, I think that in the last survey, like in the week four, we decided to add, you know, like the questions about private label and also like uh, what was the other one, Emilio, about the brands? Like um, if they were like, a, you know, like keeping the brands that they are purchasing or if yeah. they were moving, you know, like going to a different stores. So, and we see like some of the people who would go to different stores today. So, but we see like definitely the only thing that could impact is the private level. Now on my part, I think that the sharing economy 
this is something that we may see to come more. You know, like uh, think about um, that, that share economy for the food industry. But I had a baby recently and I had to buy a lot of infant formula until I had to find the right one for my baby. And I felt so bad that I had to buy so many that I didn't reuse. So maybe there is an opportunity for one of your brands, you know, like to create a different app like this, where it allow, you know, like a specific niche of consumers, because you remember, you really have to think about niche and not trying to, you know, like a, a one size fit all doesn't work, you know, like to really target those, those, uh, you know, try to convince those people. Emily? Yeah, I think I see, I see a, uh, a piggyback onto the, my response about the intermittent fasting here um, and understanding why that might be bigger um, than the no dairy or the low dairy op diet option if they're both at 9% um, penetration of the, the U.S. consumer market in 2019. Um, I think it's it's you also have to keep in mind that intermittent fasting can be combined with some of these things. No dairy is huge right now, um, you know, because some consumers are seeing that as a benefit and you know that uh, you know, dairy-free milks right now are kind of the the buzzword of the of of the industry, I think, and you know, dairy-free ice cream and all of these things. But you have to remember that there is still a very large population of people that do eat dairy and do eat cheese and do eat yogurt. Um, but both of those populations can actually take part in intermittent fasting. Um, just because you're drinking, having, or eating a non-dairy diet doesn't mean that you can't also be uh, utilizing an intermittent fasting fasting way of eating as well. Great. I think the next one may be more also for you. Like I was, if I, sorry, I was wondering if you have any example of nostalgia uh, that are being done now in sport drinks. My answer would be that it's too young of a category. Like the example that Emily provided were about ready to eat cereals, you know, like yogurts, and those, you know, like categories has been established forever. Um, I don't know personally about spot drinks. I don't know if you have seen Emily, you know, like um, any of those one. I haven't. Um, right now, what I'm, you know, what you're seeing in the sports drink category is looking towards the future. They're being very futuristic. So what you're seeing with the, you know, Gatorade, the smart cap tracking technology, they're looking on those technology integrations and really formulating the best beverage uh, for the body. I think uh, to be fair, maybe we won't see a lot of nostalgia impacting that category only because, you know, 20 years ago, either the sports nutrition, you know, sports drink category was non-existent or it was pretty fledgling. Um, and do we want to go back to that? We, I'm not sure that we do. I think we want to take advantage of a lot of that, um, you know, new information and nutrition that we have available to us so that we can make the best sports drink available. Great. Mara, I think we're up with the time, right? Yeah. Um, did you want to do one more question or are you all good? Um, let me check. Um, there is one about, uh, hold on. In your, uh, how accurate are the G Note kits and how accurate are they? Yeah. So, how accurate are the G Note you know, like the kits? I did one myself. I think Emily, you did yours, right? For me, mm -hmm. you know, like when people say like, oh, I cannot drink coffee after 2 p.m. I never understood that sentence. You know, I'm like, what's wrong with this? I don't know problem with coffee. I mean, not that I needed the test to, to confirm me this, but I'm like, okay, now that makes sense because I was absolutely not sensitive, you know, like with coffee. However, they tell me like I was kind of like, you know, like a lactose intolerant, you know, and I have to say, and you may have heard my very slight French accent, right? Even though I've been here 15 years, since I moved from France to the US, uh, I've been very like the, I don't know, I haven't been able to support the milk as well as I was, you know, like in Europe. So I truly think that those geno kits right now, they seems to be like a, on my side, they were accurate. Now it's about what are you going to do with the information? I know like in the lose it and in a few other you know like uh, there are many companies that are trying to integrate the results and i think emily mentioned right that there is i've seen a, a in paris a restaurant a sushi restaurant that are you know like using your dna so i think time will tell but i personally think this is my one of my biggest biggest trends you know like the dna uh personalization because i, I really think it's coming yeah i just just to add on to that um you know i don't have statistics on their accuracy in front of me but 
it's only going to increase and get better and kind of improve in terms of the, the type of analysis that consumers can get from their DNA analysis. I know that there has been years and years and years of research going into creating companies like Genopallet. And essentially what they do is they're doing your data or your DNA analysis, and then they're finding um, there are codes on small parts of your, your DNA that essentially um, they can read that will tell you if you have a gluten sensitivity or a caffeine sensitivity. And those have been um, scientifically um, evaluated and proven in terms of whether or not if you have it, that it is expressed as a gene um, in your, you know, your body digestion and how that your body interacts with nutrition. Um, I think that we we're still, this is very early and I think it's only going to continue to get better in terms of accuracy and predictability and then integrating that into your lifestyle as well. Yeah, I think I will finish with this last one, which maybe like will be like a lead to the next one is that what is your opinion on the increasing trend in vegan sports nutrition? And we have fantastic experts in the team that are not me, <laughs> you know, like that talking about. So we could really do like another webinar because we just finished like a, a guide actually that you can, I believe, download or very soon on our website about sport nutrition. But basically, I don't think that vegan sports drinks is the thing. It's more like, you know, like um, when you go, when you used to go to, to trade shows and last year we went to Expo West, etc. It's really like all about plant-based because if you remember, vegan is only like 4% of the population. So targeting vegan, you only attract 4%. So you should really like not limit yourself with that keyword, but more it make it plant-based. Um, voila. Terrific. Thank you guys. That was fantastic. Um, I will just make a quick comment for those who joined um, a little late that we will be sending out a recording of the webinar. So you'll be getting an email today with a link to the recording of the webinar. And then on Monday, May 11th, we'll have a, another email that'll go out and let you know uh, when the link is available to download the Megatrends guide. And the Megatrends guide is actually going to have some content in it that was not shared in this webinar due to um, time restrictions. So I encourage you all to download that guide because it will give you some additional depth and detail into some of these trends that we've discussed today. Um, so you'll be getting that link on Monday. And um, we also have a, a great blog post on the website in the news and insights section on um, Generation Me too. So if you'd like to read more about Generation Me, you'll be able to find it there. So um, thank you again for joining us. This was a terrific event and a great opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas with the industry. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar, which will, um, send out some information on that shortly. So thank you for joining us and we'll be sending a survey at the end of this webinar. So if you have a minute to complete that and give us your feedback, we would appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, bye. Bye.